So, okay, what I want to do today is, uh, uh, in the first lecture, to give you an overview of the essentially the cell biology and genetics of autophagy and uh, of endolysosomal degradation. So these, as you will see in the next uh, lecture, are two pathways that are entangled, so they are merged into one, and uh, as you will see, and they are very, very critical to neurodegeneration. Uh, as we will see later on, there's many, many alteration in these two pathways that lead to neurodegeneration. So, but in the first part, we will not really touch on the degeneration, but I want to introduce you to autophagy and the endolysosomal system, and I want to introduce you to uh, the organelles and the genes that regulate it and how we go about approaching those in Drosophila with the genetics that we have and with the tools that we have. Okay, so I'll start with uh, a schematics that is very busy, crowded, and complex. We'll, we'll navigate through that, that we wrote uh, uh, about in a recent review on autophagy and endolysosomal degradation. So the autophagic pathway is essentially, in one word, a pathway that is used by cells to essentially uh, consume their cytoplasm and their cytoplasmic components. And uh, this pathway is taking care of uh, scavenging a number of uh, uh, structures from the cytoplasm. It is entangled, so it starts essentially here. So here, imagine you're sitting in the cytoplasm, and here is where the first organelle is born by taking up a number of molecules that needs to be degraded. Okay, so this can be uh, uh, aggregated proteins, for instance, uh, that you want to dispose of. Uh, this can be pathogens that enter the cytoplasm and needs to be uh, um, cleared. Uh, this can be damaged organelles, uh, like mitochondria that no longer function, or you know, other organelles in the cells that needs to be uh, eaten up, and uh, invariantly. All these structures are taken up by a de novo forming structure that you see here, a de novo forming organelle that will be called autophagosome when it's uh, closed, that enwraps this material. So it does that by essentially using membranes that are originating from the ER mostly, from the endoplasmic reticulum, and it uses a number of components that come from uh, other organelles within the cell, for instance, a lot of uh, bits and pieces will be trafficked from the Golgi apparatus, which is you know, the secretion machine of the cell. And uh, uh, there is a number of papers in the, in the field that suggest that also other loca locales in the cells, like the plasma membrane, other organs uh, like the recycling endosome, can provide the components to this de novo forming organelle. Okay? So, so this basically wrap around the, the content and uh, it closes off the content so that it's segregated from the rest of the cytoplasm. Okay, and now things are getting interesting because this organelle uh, needs to merge with the uh, trash bin of the cell, or you know, trash bin is probably uh, uh, unkind the term for it. Uh, let's call it recycling being of the cell, which is the lysosome, which is this organelle here. The lysosome, as you know, is essentially a, an acidic uh, organelle that contains a number of uh, proteases and lipases and enzymes that generally chop down all these things to uh, minimal components that can be recycled back. For instance, when proteins are degraded, uh, you can recover amino acids, and this is a key function because essentially at the end of the process, all these will be turned into nutrients to provide to the cell. Okay, so it's not only scavenging and clearing up, which as we will see is very important, for instance, in neurons to keep the neurons healthy, but it's also energy and nutrients that are provided to the cell. Okay, so as you can imagine, the uh, Machinery in terms of molecules, which is shown here, is fairly complex to build an entire organelle down from scratch. The logic is that you need to induce the system, 
And you can do that in a couple of different ways and uh, upon a number of different stimuli. We will get a little bit more into that, but uh, you know, the main stimuli are either uh, an insult, you know, a, a damaged uh, organelle or a pathogen or a degraded protein which need to be tagged and usually a common tag for these things is the ubiquity okay and uh, this can be a starter another starter can be the energy part because as i told you the nutrients are uh, a key important output of the system and in fact upstream you have the TOR pathway, which is the master regulator of nutrients in the cell. If the TOR is active and there is energy, there is basically no induction. When the level of nutrients are going down, you're going to see uh, induction of autophagy. Another uh, pathway that leads to induction is the NPK pathway, which responds mostly to sugars, and uh, this can be also controlled at uh, uh, the level of hormones and a number of other inputs. Okay, so the, the initiation complex uh, is essentially formed by a PI3K complex and BITG1 complex uh, through a number of uh, phosphorylation control, essentially the start of the process. And then you have, uh, together with the tagging of the components uh, of the system, you have uh, a uh, process of expansion of the organelle uh, from the ER. And this uh, leads, uh, requires a, a, a quite interesting system of genes and proteins uh, that are similar to the ubiquitin system. So you have essentially three cascade of uh, three enzymes in a cascade, E3, uh, E1, E2, and E3, that leads uh, to the lipidation of this component, the TG8, which is inserted in the membrane to make it in a very peculiar, very different organelle from another organelle with a membrane in the cell, okay? The other peculiar aspect is because you are going to build the organelle de novo from essentially an ER cisterna, uh, the organelle that you get is rather unique, and we will see it in a second, because it has a double membrane, so with a lumen in, in the middle. Okay, so there is a lumen between the two membranes and then there is the lumen in which you have the sequestered material. Okay, then you need to fuse to a lysosome for degradation, but things are getting even more interesting and in the rest of the talk and my presentation we will actually stand more or less around here because the system is merging with the, the endolysosomal system, which instead takes care of clearing uh, proteins and components that are associated to membrane or transmembrane, okay? So this, imagine, is a similar system in the logic, but uh, it uh, will take care of proteins that are either associated to the face of the membrane, either on one side or the other side, from starting, say, the plasma membrane, or are uh, indeed the transmembrane protein, which you cannot really separate from a membrane. So you don't see the start of this pathway, but essentially what happens is that when, uh, we'll see a little bit of that, when the cargo that are coming this way from the endosomal system are uh, uh, incorporated in an endosome, then another machinery, which is called uh, the escort machinery, takes care of putting this cargo from the limiting membrane two internal vesicles, and since you cannot really separate, and we will see that as well, since you cannot really separate these molecules from the membrane, what the escort machinery will do, it will essentially push in part of the limiting membrane of this organelle, which is an endosome, to form a so-called multivesicular body uh, that has little vesicles that are coming from invagination of the limiting membrane containing all the cargos and we will see that as well. Um, now, then, when you have these two organelles, which are essentially little brothers in, this, in a sense, so, so this takes care of clearing things from the cytoplasm, this takes care of clearing things from the membranes, then you uh, merge them with a lysosome. And this is quite interesting because it's fairly uh, uh, not fully understood yet, 
So there are fusions that are direct from this to the lysosome. There are fusions that are direct from these two organelles to make a third organelle that is called amphisome. Uh, and then, uh, then you have a degradation coming with fusion with the lysosome. So there, there's a, a couple of different ways of doing this, and it's not clear how this is really regulated. We will talk about uh, a little bit these ESCO genes. We will talk about the snares, which are fusion molecules that are important for fusion of the autophagosomes to the lysosomes, and uh, we will focus a little bit on that. And then we will also talk about uh, uh, the so-called Linus system, which is a system at the level of the lysosome that tries to compensate uh, with whatever happens upstream. Okay, so you, you, you have to keep in mind, uh, as I said, that the system is inducible. So think about something that is not really fixed. Uh, is in cells, is more or less used uh, at the basal level to clear up a number of things, but then it can really be activated on call. Okay. And uh, this poses a challenge to the lysosomes that have to compensate for that because things will be coming sometimes in a, in a, in a strong flux and sometimes in a, in a light flux. And the lysosome has to react, uh, and so the lysosomal compartment has to expand and contract uh, depending on this. And the Linus system using the bipolar TPAs and, uh, and uh, TFEB in particular, the two molecules that we will talk about, uh, takes care of compensating that and ensuring that there is a, a constant level of nutrients that are pushed out of the system and components that are pushed out of the system. Right, so, so this is what I essentially told you at the cell level. So, you know, you have uh, uh, sensors at the cellular level, transducers, or most of these molecules that you have seen, and effectors that are basically all the machinery. Uh, that will lead to the mobilization of cellular nutrients or the clearance. But then you have to think that this is integrated in, and this is relevant to thinking about Drosophila, uh, this is, as an organism, this is integrated in the larger uh, system of the organism. And in the organism, there is a systemic part that deals with nutrients, because of course the, the, the animal will feed and make nutrients available. So there is an extra step uh, on top of the cellular step, which has to do with the neuroendocrine circuits and the hormones that uh, will tell the system you have to engage autophagy or not, depending on the amount of nutrients that are provided systemically. Okay. Right. Uh, let's now take a look at the, the organelles. Uh, and one good technique for cell biology to actually look at these organelles is like a quite old technique, but that I find still quite informative because you can really see things is electron microscopy. Okay. So, for instance, here is how an autophagosome will look in an epithelial cell. So this is uh, an epithelial cell of an imaginal disc uh, of Drosophila. And uh, here you can see uh, within the cytoplasm uh, two autophagosomes. And uh, you can appreciate the double membrane arrangement that I told you before. So this uh, the black line. Each black line will be a membrane in this uh, sort of uh, metal shading that uh, you do in the preparation. And uh, as you can see, within this uh, uh, double membrane, there is a clear lumen. And within the lumen, the proper lumen of the autophagosome, there are other structures, that, which are the ones that have been taken up. Okay? This can be, again, mitochondria. This can be bits of the R. It can be all sorts of things that uh, need to be cleared up. Um, here is the appearance of a multivesicular body. So this is the broader organelle that takes care of degradation of proteins. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, uh, delimited by a single membrane. And you can see that it has all these very small internal vesicles. Uh, imagine that uh, these organelles are, are more or less one micron across in diameter. Uh, these little vesicles are around 50 nanometers, so they're very tiny, and they contain all the material that is associated to the membrane that needs to be degraded. 
And this is how a lysosome will appear. It's a, a granule that is very dense. It's limited again by a membrane, and then there is a very electron dense material, which is basically all the digested material and the enzymes. Uh, and uh, this is how an amphisome will look like. So this is the merging, essentially, of this and that. Uh, and uh, there will be so bits that have a, a double membrane, which are remnants of the fusion of the uh, uh, autophagosome, and bits that have a single membrane, which comes from the, auto, uh, from the multivesicular body. And internally, you have a mixture of uh, the organelles and whatever has been taken up by the autophagosome. And uh, you have little vesicles that are coming from that. So uh, essentially, then you make everything uh, together, and then you fuse with a lysosome for degradation. And oftentimes, in the Rosophila mm -hmm. cells, you will see these doublets of uh, an amphisome or an MVB, if it's only the MVB, and lysosomes that are paired, and they are ready to fuse uh, and, and to degrade the material. Um, actually, in a normal cell, here we have done a little trick, because in a normal cell, you will mostly see these structures. It's kind of difficult, because they are fairly rare to see autophagosome and, and, and uh, multivesicular bodies. There's not many of them. And so you actually here you're looking at the section of mutant cells in which we have a mutation, as we will see, in a gene that regulates fusion of autophagosomes. So you accumulate these autophagosomes. Uh, and here you have a mutation in a gene that regulates the degradation in the lysosome. So you accumulate uh, a lot of undegraded uh, material in the multivesicular bodies. Okay, so uh, as I was telling you before, um, the merging is actually interesting. So, and this is where we are interested in, uh, in the lab. So we work mostly on this particular window. And I will start to tell you a little bit of the genes uh, that uh, regulate uh, this merging. So the first genes that are interesting, because again, as I said, they regulate the formation of these internal vesicles, are the genes of the escort complex. Uh, to go a little bit more into the detail, uh, this is the architecture of the escort complex. Uh, you have to imagine that here there would be your uh, membrane that contains the uh, molecules, the transmembrane molecules that need to be degraded. And here we are on the endosomal part. And uh, what the escort machinery will do is uh, will recognize that the molecules that need to be degraded because these have been ubiquitinated. So they have a ubiquity moiety attached. And imagine that again, here you will have the membrane, here you will have the lumen, and here you're facing the cytoplasm. So there would be a first complex, which is called ESCOR0, which binds the ubiquitin and corals essentially all these cargo that needs to be degraded so that they are separated from other areas of the membrane. And then it recruits the ESCOR2 uh, uh, escort 1 and escort 2 machinery, which is still associated to the ubiquitin. This is essentially a scaffold, and is a scaffold for the business end of the complex, which is made by these filaments uh, of uh, different uh, uh, escort components. And the filaments uh, are providing two functions. One uh, is uh, to keep uh, all this coral cargo together in an area of the uh, endosomal membrane. And the second function is that they will basically sit on the membrane and form a ring. Uh, and this ring has uh, some sort of bend in a way that it creates an invagination in the membrane. So basically all the cargos that are ubiquinated are scooped down, but also the membrane is scooped down. And now you create and invaginate these internal vesicles that you have seen in the multivesicular body. Okay, now you can see these in actually Drosophila cells because what you can do with Drosophila is uh, mosaic clones in tissues and people that would be familiar with Drosophila know what I'm referring to and people that are not familiar think that this is essentially a similar way of uh, doing uh, uh, conditional 
uh, knockout in a certain tissue, just the genetics is, is rather different. And here is essentially uh, a schematics of an imaginal disc. This is an eye antenna imaginal disc, so the structure of the fly that will make the adult eye and the adult antenna. And here you can see that uh, by this technique you can start from an animal that is essentially heterozygous for your mutation, and then you can make some cells of mosaicos as in a mosaic. So you have patches of cells that are mutant for the gene that you want to study, and patches of cells that are uh, essentially homozygous uh, and, and perfectly fine, uh, don't carry the mutation. And in, uh, in uh, Esker mutant cells, you can see that you have a problem digesting uh, molecules because if you uh, look in a real tissue, so here is a real imaginal disk, and here you can see a clone of cells that are mutant. The wild type cells are marked by GFP, and so you can see uh, where are the wild type cells and where are the mutant cells. If you can see in these cells, uh, there is a huge accumulation of ubiquitin because uh, essentially uh, the cargos are not digested, they are sitting on the limiting membrane of the endosome, the multivesicular body is not formed, and uh, every cargo that needs to go down that way is essentially sitting there with the ubiquity molecule and it's not digested. Okay? An example of a cargo that we study a lot in the lab is actually uh, the receptor notch, which is a component of uh, a signaling pathway, and we will talk a little bit about notch also for the signaling part uh, in the next uh, uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, as you can see in this other image, and this is uh, again an imaginal disk, uh, and here I have taken out for simplicity the GFP part, uh, so you have pink lines that are showing you where the mutant clone is. As you can see in the mutant clones, uh, Notch, which is ubiquitinated and undergo this pathway to be degraded in the cells, is actually stuck there and accumulates. And uh, if you look at uh, higher magnification in, uh, in uh, uh, a part of the disc where there are no clones, uh, essentially you can see that uh, in the folds of the tissue, Notch localizes normally it does on the apical side and in these little dots which are endosomes on its way to degradation, okay? Whereas in uh, an area similar to the clones that you can see here, notch is all stuck in internal endosomes because it cannot really be digested, okay? So the escorts are uh, very important for that. Now, um, let's take a different setup in which we look, instead of a mosaic disc, we look at in, in an entirely mutant disc. So we can do a trick with the technology of the mosaic technology and now generate a disc in which we remove the wild type cell. And it's very easy because what you do is, uh, instead of putting a marker on the wild type cells, you put uh, a cell lethal mutation. And so you start from your mutation and a cellita mutation, both are in heterozygosity, so there's no problem to the, to the cell and to the tissue. But then when you do this trick, uh, then you separate uh, mutant cells for what you want to analyze, uh, and then you eliminate uh, the other cells. And so you end up with a disc that is purely mutant. And now we go from analyzing only the endosomal part to analyzing also autophagy, and then we're going to look at some of the molecules that I told you in the schematics, and we look both at endocytosis and at autophagy. In order to do that, we are going to use two markers that I'm going to refer to uh, also later on. One is notch, which I just told you, and notch as uh, I told you, goes down the way of uh, endocytosis and degradation this way because it's a transmembrane molecule. But then we want to look also at autophagy. So we look at P62, which is uh, an adapter that is specific, uh, recognizing, specifically recognizing autophagic cargos. 
So P62 will essentially start to concentrate when you have a set of cargos that uh, need to undergo autophagy and it's maintained until uh, autophagy is degraded because it's sequestered within the autophagosome uh, and uh, then everything gets degraded when uh, finally it reaches uh, into a lysosome. And so now we're going to look comparatively at the mutant disk for a number of genes uh, and we will look at both the pathways uh, to illustrate uh, of how these genes work. All right, so here, what you're looking at in this wild type control, you're looking essentially at the region of the disc around here. So here you have the apical fold of the tissue. There will be multiple cells that you cannot really see one by one there. And again, you're looking mostly at notch, which has an apical localization and and a lot of dots, which are this notch that leads in endosome on its way to degradation. Now, for what uh, concerns autophagy, there's a very little signal because the disc itself does autophagy but is not particularly in a condition in which uh, it lacks nutrients or is not insulted in any way, and so basically it does not uh, accumulate a lot of P62 positive material normally. But now, if you start touching the system, then you start seeing something going on. So for instance, here is a mutant disc that is fu fully mutant for EPG13, which is uh, acting on early stages of autophagy before the formation of the autophagosome. So what you can see here is uh, that the notch is more or less okay. So the localization is uh, essentially similar, so it's on the apical side and all these dots. But now you have a huge accumulation of autophagy cargos because any cargo that will be formed and targeted with P62, which is called REF2P in Drosophila, uh, will be sitting there and it's not clear, okay? And as you can see here, then you have uh, a huge <coughs> blobs within uh, the cytoplasma of the cells of uh, autophagy cargo that uh, build up over time and that are not uh, clear. Now, in, uh, in the escort mutant, uh, it actually appears to occur something very interesting. So, in the, in the escort mutants, despite the escorts are important to make the multivesicular body, uh, you have problems both in uh, uh, degradation of notch, as I showed you in the previous slide, but you also have problems in clearance of autophagy. And we still don't understand why is that. So, this could uh, be because the multivesicular body needs to merge with an autophagosome in order to go on the pathway of degradation, but it seems that in some cells this can be, is a passage that can be skipped and uh, that the autophagosome can fuse directly with the lysosomes, with lysosomes. And so we don't really yet know mechanistically why you need the, the escorts also for the autophagic pathway, but this is the situation. So autophagy does not progress if these escort genes that provide the sorting of the cargo that are associated to the membrane and uh, the invagination of membrane to form the multivesicular bodies are not active. And this is true for uh, all sorts of escorts. Now, this is a mutant in a gene that is important for functionality of the lysosome. And uh, as you can see, you have a quite a similar pattern to here. You have a blockage of the uh, clearance of notch and a blockage of the clearance of the P62. And this is because this is the final organelle in which everything uh, coalesces and that uh, in which everything gets degraded. Now, we will talk about uh, later on about this mutant called SNAP29, the, this gene called SNAP29. So in, this, in the mutant for SNAP29, you have a different situation. You have some effect on notch and some effect on autophagy, but these are on two separate, separated organelles. And in fact, it turns out, but we will see that a little bit more in detail, it turns out that SNAP29, which is a snare, so it's a protein that is required for membrane fusion, has uh, multiple roles, one infusion of autophagosomes to lysosomes uh, and uh, potentially also amphisome to lysosomes and one also in uh, degradation of notch at a different uh, level. 
and this is something that we study in the lab. Uh, so we are, I'm going to give you in the uh, uh, next few slides a little bit of a story that we have published recently that is about uh, SNAP29 and how we figured out uh, that this is important for fusion of the autophagosomes to the lysosomes and to complete autophagy. All right, so this is what a snare is. Again, I said it is a molecule that is important for fusion. Uh, uh, SNAP29 is essentially belongs to uh, this class of molecules and uh, it, normally the system of fusion uh, involves uh, uh, three or four proteins, one that is carried by one membrane, in this case it's a vesicle, but it can be an organelle like in the case of the autophagosome, and one that is carried, uh, so it's integral, to a target molecule, and then there is a, a molecule like SNAP29 that uh, uh, contains two domains uh, called snare domains, uh, which essentially paired up uh, in a zipper uh, with uh, the molecule carried by one membrane and the molecule carried by the, the other membrane. So you can see SNAP29 as a sort of a glue molecularly to have this zipper occurring, and this zipper has been very well characterized. What happens essentially is this. Uh, when uh, the zippering occurs, essentially the membranes are coming uh, close together and then you essentially pull out all the water that is in between the membranes and the lipids will, the lipids will fuse and uh, you have merging of the content. This happens when a vesicle reaches a, a, a target membrane like in synaptic transmission for instance but it also happens when two organelles are fusing together uh, and uh, then you essentially have energy uh, with uh, an ATPA's machine that untangles this uh, because this is uh, now tightly bound on the receiving membrane and you go through a different cycle. And uh, uh, this pair up is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, stable. It essentially, uh, the, the four helices that you see are essentially bridging by forming hydrophobic uh, 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 interaction, except for this central layer, that which is used to, um, you know, pull in uh, the ATPAs uh, and, and untangle the, uh, the the zippering. Now, um, we didn't know that SNAP29 was involved in, uh, in regulation of autophagy, but uh, we started, uh, we isolated a mutant in Drosophila in a screen, and we started characterizing the mutant. And the first thing by studying trafficking that we looked at again is whether uh, mutant cells that you generate this way have problems with metabolism of uh, uh, cargos, and this is a, a similar experiment to the one that I showed you before, except that we do it with the clones, and except that we are looking both at the ubiquitin NP62. And what essentially we found in clones of SNAP29 cells, which are shown here, again, the blue cells are wild-type cells, is that uh, there is a clearly an autophagic problem because there is a, a strong accumulation of P62, as I showed you before. But then there is also potentially an endocytic problem because there is an accumulation of ubiquitin. Actually, ubiquitin is used as a signal on both branches, so you can't really quite tell, but we had other reasons to tell also that there is also an endocytic problem. But again, as I told you, uh, EM uh, is uh, usually a good technique to see what is going on if you are interested in the cell biology of trafficking. And so what we have done is uh, to process mutant cells also for electron microscopy. And uh, what you can see in the next slide is a little piece of uh, an imaginal disk cell. Uh, uh, and uh, what you can see is a tomogram. So here we basically took a tight, uh, a, 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 a thick, sorry, <laughs> section, and we are sort of reconstructed it and rotated it. And what was striking from these cells was that the cytoplasm was all packed by all these organelles, which are essentially autophagosomes. And we didn't really uh, 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 see that coming. Actually, it was a big surprise because we were actually interested in uh, 
endocytosis, and we're not really thinking about autophagy, so the experiment that I showed you before, we actually did it afterwards. But uh, uh, we found, actually, that the main phenotype in these cells was uh, accumulation of autophagosomes that uh, normally are not there. So for a while, we played with this idea that this autophagosome might come from a huge upregulation of autophagy upstream. But then, uh, knowing of the nature of the molecule, and due to other experiments that we have done, we came to the conclusion that, in fact, this accumulation of autophagosome is because the autophagosome, after they are made, cannot really fuse to the receiving compartment, which would be either an MVB or a lysosome. So they are essentially stuck there. And we came to that conclusion uh, together with a couple of other groups. So here is a schematics from a review from uh, uh, the group of Mizushima, which works mainly in autophagy and publish more or less at, at the same time it has these uh, findings. Uh, basically, the, the, the complete story is that uh, the autophagosome has a very peculiar way of fusing. It uh, will require SNAP29. Uh, it will require a lysosome with this uh, snare protein, uh, but of course uh, it will require a molecule also on uh, the autophagosome, which is uh, the syntaxin 17. But because the autophagosome is formed de novo, this molecule is actually inserted only when the autophagosome is fully closed to prevent, potentially, fusion of uh, not formed, not fully formed organelles. And so there is a, a quite mysterious uh, transfer of syntaxin 17, which normally lives in the ER, uh, outside of uh, the ER membrane to the autophagosomal membrane. And this potentially is uh, uh, occurring because the, this is a very peculiar syntaxin that doesn't have a full transmembrane domain, so it's not fully crossing a membrane, but it has a band a transmembrane domain, so it's only inserted like a pin on the external side, so you can sort of flip from one membrane to the other membrane. All right, so SNAP29 in this context is essentially a pin to bring together these and these to enact the fusion. There was another phenotype which we're still studying, which is interesting and it gives me an excuse to show you some more uh, nice EM. And the other phenotype is uh, shown here, this is another tomogram. Here again, you can see uh, it's a still a, a SNAP29 mutant cell. You can see a double membrane organelle, so this autophagosome within the cytoplasm. But then you can also see that here there is a jagged channel that opens up on something that looks like an autophagosome. And also you can see that on top of the cell, there's a lot of material enwrapped by a single membrane uh, that uh, contain internal structures like an autophagosome. So to cut a long story short, uh, as I will show you in the next couple of slides, in this mutant, not only you have an accumulation of autophagosome, but you also have a, a, a secretion of autophagosome to the outside. And uh, we don't really know molecularly how this occurs, whether this is because uh, the syntaxin 17 is now free in absence of SNAP29 to bind some other snare, the plasma membrane will be released, or if this is an indirect consequence of the fact that the cell has to cope with all this material that does not get degraded, and now it decides to essentially throw it out. Uh, secretion of lysosome is something that occurs also for clearing material sometimes, so potentially this could be a sort of a semi-physiologic way of getting rid of the material that you cannot really digest yourself. Uh, it is quite clear that these are autophagosomes because these can be marked by a TG8, which is a marker of uh, autophagosomes. This is an immuno-EM in which we take an antibody and we uh, label uh, molecules within the EM section. And uh, here you can see an autophagosome outside of the cell, so this would be the upper lumen of the cell, and you can see that it has a TG8. So 
this uh, proves uh, that uh, these uh, structures that you see much better in here are actually autophagosomes. Now, um, we can also see that these are autophagosomes because if we look in the disc by immunofluorescence and uh, we label with a TG8, uh, normally we see in wild type disc only, a, again, a basal level of autophagy, so a little labeling of a TG8. But then, if we look at the SNAP29 mutant discs, we can see a huge accumulation of a TG8 within the cell. But then we can see also a huge accumulation of a TGA in between cells where two layers of the tissue are coming close together, okay? And this is also true for uh, P62. So again, this is a wild type of situation in the disc where you can see your cells arrange and lumen between the two layers of the tissue. And uh, yeah, as you can see in this situation, the P62 is also present outside in the lumen. Okay. Now, uh, interestingly, SNAP29 is not only regulating autophagy, and this is uh, being a snare probably not so surprising because it can regulate fusion of other uh, structures. But this was also evident when we look at the morphology of the overall disc itself. Now, so here is uh, the whole disc, uh, and this is a wild type disc. Again, it's an eye antenna disc and the antennal part, and so this is the normal structure that it has. Uh, here again, we are labeling with an apical marker. Again, it's notch, and this is P62. And here you are seeing how uh, an ATGA, ATG13 disc is looking like. It's basically normal. So again, you see these dots of P62 because autophagy is not working, but the morphology of the disc is normal. And actually these flies that are mutant uh, will have a normal eye disc and a normal eye as a result, uh, even if they are not able to uh, do autophagy. Uh, the mutant itself is not lethal, so you don't even have to make a clone, so you can look at the adult fly that is fully mutant for ATG13 the phenotype that these flies will have, and this is true, we will see also for others autophagy genes that are only acting in autophagy, is that it will have a shorter lifespan and a number of problems of neurodegeneration, but we will see that in the next lecture. Whereas with the SNAP29, there is a clear alteration of the architecture of the disc, indicating that the snare is important in other processes in the cells in addition to autophagy, that have a clear importance for uh, the architecture of the tissue, the shaping of the tissue, the polarity of the cells, and the formation of the other structures. And in fact, this is a little gene, so you cannot really make adults or even larvae uh, that uh, are homozygous for, for, for SNAP29. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, there is also mutation in, in humans uh, that uh, affect the SNAP29, and you get, uh, uh, there, luckily there are only a few patients, but you get a congenital syndrome that is called Sednik, uh, in which uh, you are born, uh, uh, but you don't unfortunately live much longer, so it's, it's a congenital pediatric syndrome that has a very, very poor uh, life expectancy, and then what you get is a multisystemic set of defects that affect most epithelia. So here is the most prominent that you can uh, see very easily, which is in the skin, where the skin is completely altered. You get uh, essentially an alteration of the top, layer, top layers and, and bottom layers, and essentially you get uh, uh, all this uh, keratoderma, and, uh, and, and traits, but also in the nervous system, you get uh, essentially in the brain a number of structures that are missing, uh, um, and a number of things that are incompatible eventually with life, indicating uh, that the fact that the SNAP29 is essential for a number of processes occurring in cells uh, that uh, will have uh, a bearing on uh, the development of tissue and organs, okay? 
Right, so now in the last few slides, I want to bring you more down into the system. So we talk a little bit about escorts, we talk a little bit about SNAP29, and now we are going to talk about uh, the VATPAs uh, and uh, uh, TFEB, although we will touch mostly on TFEB on, on the second lecture. And essentially, these are master players in the lysosomal. Uh, regulation of degradation and on these uh, uh, set of uh, uh, processes that ensure that the system matches up the induction that you have upstream, as I told you at the beginning. So we'll start from the vacuolar TPAs. The vacuolar TPAs is a fairly complex enzyme uh, that essentially serves as a proton pump and this is sitting on the lysosomal membrane facing the lumen of the membrane so this will be the cytoplasmic part and this is the luminal part the vacuolar TPAs uh, essentially uses ATP from uh, the uh, uh, cytoplasmic part to push protons across the membrane and this is a key process because this is what will acidify the lumen of the lysosome uh, bringing all these enzymes so that only work at, uh, in an acidic compartment to life. So without the VATPAs, there's no uh, degradation occurring. Uh, and uh, uh, this is actually used in, uh, in specialized cell types also to acidify other structures. In fact, in a lot of cells, the VATPAs is also sitting on the plasma membrane and it's used to acidify the extracellular environment. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of experiments again based on uh, our uh, techniques on, to show how this is critical for uh, endosomal degradation. And uh, you can see that, uh, again, with clones of cells made in the disk. In this case, we make clones of uh, uh, VATPA's uh, uh, component uh, uh, mutants. And essentially, what you can see Again, if you track notch, which is, uh, uh, again, an endocytic cargo, and this uh, we tracked with the trafficking assay, which we use uh, the antibody of notch, and this is what I put in your protocols for you uh, to try uh, uh, in, uh, in your lab if you want. Uh, you can use an antibody to recognize the extracellular part of notch uh, to give to discs that are not fixed, so that the antibody is taken up and can travel with notch through degradation. And essentially what you can see is, again, these are mutant cells for VATPAs and these are wild type cells, that if you wait long enough, uh, enough for the wild type cells to degrade or notch, in these cells, notch is still sitting in the lysosome, so not showing here the costainin, which is actually here. Here you have a marker for lysosomes, which is GFP lamp one and here you have a labeling of notch, and you can see that a lot of this accumulated notch is actually sitting in lysosome and is not uh, degraded. Um, that these are lysosomes you can also see because there is no accumulation of these clones in, of ubiquitin, and ubiquitin for the endosomal part uh, is essentially taken away before the cargo is inserted in the multivesicular body. Uh, and uh, generally, it's not really much accumulating when there is uh, only an autophagic, uh, uh, sorry, an endocytic problem. In this case, it's quite, uh, and we still don't know why, it's quite controversial because we do have also an autophagy problem, we know that we are not degrading autophagic cargo, so we should see some of the ubiquitin that is coming up when uh, autophagy is not uh, functioning till the end, but we don't uh, see much of that. Now, uh, the VATPAs is not only important for pumping protons, but it's also acting as a sensor because it's at the earth of the matter in a sense, uh, and in fact is uh, one of the key components of this uh, sensing apparatus that uh, will keep uh, things in sync with induction of autophagy. And this is well studied 
in the context of nutrients and amino acid uh, re recovery. This has been studied a lot by the group of uh, uh, Sabatini and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Rosa Perquillano and uh, in Drusophila also by Aurelio Telemann. Uh, and uh, uh, essentially, the situation is that uh, the VATPAs will be part of the system that tells whether in the lysosome there's a lot of amino acids from degradation that can be recovered, okay? and or not. So, and the situation is that when uh, there is a lot of amino acids that can be recovered through a sense in that goes through VATPAs, but it's not really clear how it is enacted, how the VATPAs senses the amino acid. Essentially, there will be a disassociation of the torque machinery from the VATPAs and an association of the torque machinery to the lysosome to signal that there is energy. And uh, you can, uh, uh, block or anyway keep autophagy low, so you don't need to recover extra energy because there is enough, okay? Whereas uh, uh, when uh, there is very low level of amino acids that you recover, this machinery is associated normally with torque 1 and the lysosome becomes associated to the VATPAs and it sends a signal to the system is not available to torque, which is inactive, it's saying a signal, signal to the system that you need to make more lysosomes and you need to make more autophagy. The way it does it, it, it uses the factor, this factor called TFEB, which is a transcription factor, which normally in condition of uh, energy is also associated to the lysosome and it's phosphorylated, so it's kept inactive, attached to the lysosome, but when there is low level of nutrients and this machinery is essentially inactive, uh, it loses its phosphorylation, it becomes uh, free to go into the nucleus and it acts as a transcription factor as it is to activate the transcription of autophagy genes and ly lysosomal biogenesis genes. And this is the way the end of the system tells the beginning of the system that it needs to restart to keep things in flux, okay? Now, to illustrate the importance of the VATPAs in these, I'm going to show you a little experiment that we have done actually in human cells, uh, and this is my very last slide for, for the first uh, part of, of, of the, my presentations. So in here you can see cells in cultures, these are actually uh, mcf cells, so breast epithelial cells, human breast epithelial cells, and, uh, and as you can see, if the cells are kept in culture, uh, TFEB is mostly uh, away from the nuclei, sitting mostly in lysosomes, so here you don't see much of that, but it's basically not in the nuclei. And if you track the lysosomes with lysotracker, which is a dye that marks uh, uh, acidic organelles, you can see that there is a certain number of lysosomes, and, and that's it. But now, uh, if you uh, basically inhibit the VATPAs, uh, and so you are basically making lysosomes over time that are not able to degrade, uh, instead of uh, uh, shutting down uh, much of the acidification that uh, you should see with the lysotracker, what you see is actually a paradoxical effort. What you see is a huge number of lysosomes that are made in the cell. So the cell is now packed with lysosomes. And what you can see is also that TFEB is uh, very strongly kept in the nucleus. So the trick here is that we use an inhibitor of VATPAs that is called bafilomycin that doesn't shut down completely the VATPAs, so otherwise we would kill the cell and, and clear the acidification. But actually, we keep it to a level that provides the cell with enough degradation to uh, get by. But in this case, uh, the system, and this has been uh, going uh, you know, for, for a few days, the system readjusts in a situation in which it needs uh, many, many more lysosomes, because the lysosomes are less active. So essentially, everything is readjusted with enhanced autophagy, enhanced lysosomal degradation, and enhance uh, lysosomes in order to recover the same amount of energy that the cell 
any way needs. Okay? Right, so uh, just to sum up, what I told you in this part is that the autophagy and the endolysosomal <coughs> system control protein and organelle degradation in the cells. You have these two branches that are taking care of membrane-associated proteins and of cytoplasmic proteins. The system is key to maintain the balance of nutrients and ensure the proteostasis and organelle stasis in the cell. So it's really, really important. Uh, you want, don't want, you, it's one of the systems that you don't see much, but you don't want to upset the system much as well. Uh, the sequestration of the cytoplasmic cargos, of course, in, in autophagy by the normal formation of autophagosomes uh, that are normally not there. And the sequestration of the membrane-associated cargos relies on the escort and the formation of the multivesicular bodies, as I showed you. Uh, the fusion of autophagosomes with the endolysosomal system uses a dedicated set of nares, and I showed you a little bit of SNAP29 and how it is required for that. And uh, in the last part, I told you about the vacuole RTPAs, how uh, it is central for lysosomal degradation and also for lysosomal biogenesis and uh, uh, essentially homeostasis of the system. And then for the neurodegenerative part, which you, you haven't heard about, we'll discuss a little bit of that uh, in the next lecture. So thank you for the attention.